Hi, uh, my name is Forrest Gowder and my partner Patricia, we're from Sunroots Farm. Yeah. Uh, we're a small cannabis farm in Covalo, California. Um, 10 acres. Uh, I've been producing cannabis for over 20 years now and um, we And I've been working on together. a lot of different farms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's really rooted in my ancestry. My grandparents were tobacco farmers and uh, my grandmother was an herbalist so it's really important to us to keep that uh, in our roots keep following your truth uh, so yeah we'll get started we only have 20 minutes we're Sunrise Farm we just told you what we were um, and these are going to be our offerings today the title of the this little slide is seed, soil, medicine and community so I'm really hoping to bring it full circle from the seed to community this is a picture of our garden. Um, as many of the regenerative farms around here, we do a lot of different uh, native medicinal plants, as well as perennial plants, as well as other herbs in the garden. Um, and we like to grow really large plants. We're like... Oyster. We like to grow full term, uh, three full seasons, so spring, summer, and fall, in the ground, um, full sun, without any, uh, any lights or anything like that. So. Um, we try to just grow real medicine, so. <laughs> so we'll start with the seed selection, and this is a really part of our regenerative farming too, is that you're collecting your seeds and you're con continually creating loops in your system and on your farm that you don't have to go out and rely on anybody else. You don't need to purchase seeds from other people. You can do trades with your friends. It's uh, really low cost, and that's a big goal of our whole practices as well, is bringing it full circle, reducing cost, and um, being able to, to give back to our communities. Because we've reduced our costs so much, we have that little extra in the bank accounts that we can actually go ahead and donate and give to charity. Yeah, you're not relying on other people you know, to grow seeds for you. So and you're not relying on people uh, to make clones and you don't know what you're bringing into your farm if you're buying clones. So it's really important to, uh, you know, full circle, make those seeds, grow those seeds, harvest them and make more. So. And know them really well, know your seeds. So you can talk about, there's a few photos here about what you're doing when you're selecting for seeds and cannabis. Uh, I select varieties that I particularly like. I like beauty. I. I want to see more beauty in this world and in the garden especially, so that's where I can express it, express how I portray it out in the world. So um, I like beautiful sticky buds and lots of terps and... Uh, lots of trichomes. Lots so of shiny trichomes <laughs> all over. <laughs> We have this um, Velvet Perps lineage, which we, we've started, that we, we want to keep moving forward with. It's getting to know your seeds and working continuously with them over years. We've been working like eight years with this one plant. So yeah, now we have a f whole line of Velvet Perps crosses that I cross into all my other stuff that I really like. So. Another way to select is what are you selecting for? Are you looking for those terps? Are you looking for the size of the plant and the yield that you're going to get? Are you looking for some type of smell, some type of terpenoid that's unique? It's not just myrcene, but it's all got this really crazy full profile. So getting to know your seeds. So yeah, we have started making our own soil. It really just comes down to what's in your soil. Um, if you're going to want to grow healthy plants, what's going on in the ground, it's a mere image of what's going on above. So um, feed the soil, feed the bugs, and in turn, it, they will all feed you in and in full circle. So. This is a picture of our ladies, our alpaca ladies. I'm really connected to them because um, they're part of my cultural heritage. And they are wonderful. And having animals on the property is another part of the closed loop regenerative um, system where you want to be able to make your own compost. You want to be able to produce your own soil. This last year, we didn't have to buy any plastic bags of 
soil, which saved us so much money. We did not have to buy potting soil, which we have in the past. And of course, you're going to start from where you are. You're not going to miraculously end up doing all the things you want to do in one year. It takes many years for you to get to that point. So set your goals and uh, know what you can do and be compassionate with yourself, right? Like, it, you don't have to be perfect in the first 15 minutes of anything. We really enjoy having these animals on our property. Uh, not, give it, not just giving us this amazing uh, byproduct that they, uh, they give us. And they do that in a communal dung pile, so it's easy to collect. But they, you know, eat all the, the, the grass and the blackberries up to help, you know, with fire prevention. So it's really a nice symbiotic relationship they have with the land and with us. And a beautiful part of the alpacas especially, um, there are some animals like that we have that we do, you always want to do, practice rotational grazing, but with the alpacas, they actually leave the root system intact, so they're grazing and grazing your land, and underneath, the roots are still there, um, unlike some animals where they will take out the root system and you will have to replant cover crops or native, um, native seed. So that's a great thing about the alpacas. They're very soft padded. You, you do have, have to, sorry, you, you do have to uh, keep them out of your garden if you don't want them to eat it. They love the weed. They love weed. They might they be able to it. pick your leaves for you, but they'll, they'll get into the flowering too. So you want to keep them out when they're flowering. Chickens as well, little workers on the farm eating all the good bugs, bad bugs, you know, but they're also like fertilizing as they roam around the canopy and underneath the plants. Plus they feed us. And they are Delicious egg eggs. layers, so they feed us eggs. Another closed loop. Here we are uh, making our soil for our starts in the beginning of the year. Um, so we use uh, sand from local sand, uh, hay from the fields around us, and uh, manure from our alpacas, and our leaves that comes from the trees around us too. So we try to just source all of our ingredients locally on the, on the farm or very close. Within 10 miles. And for us, you know, we are producing a lot of soil and a lot of compost. Basically, each one of our beds is a huge compost pile that the plant gets directly planted into. And we also source from our neighbors, like, and whoever, you know, you can start, that's what's beautiful about the regenerative agriculture is like, you're also including your community. So you know who in your community has extra horse manure or who's got the good hay or whatever it is you know those people and you connect with them. They're, they're people you can bargain with. So it's a beautiful full circle where you really don't have to be buying and spending a ton of money. A lot of people's waste is, you know, just wasted. So we'd use that waste and make something beautiful out of it. Like somebody asked me, what do you do with your stalks? Well, I just chop and drop them right down where they are and put them right back in the soil and feed the organisms. With, with the stalks, so that's really nice. So just an image of the compost, you can see there's a lot of material there, and basically every year we're building that soil more and more and more. We continue just adding and adding and adding to it. And it creates less work because we don't have to move our compost from one pile, we just created our compost right there. So it's a all we have to do in the springtime because in the fall we've been prepping and we've been adding to these plots all year long, spring, summer, fall, and winter, so that um, not only does it break the work even across the year, so you're not struggling to work all spring or all fall, all you have to do is meadow fork that and it's ready to be planted into. Yeah, a lot of our prep happens in the, in the fall where during the winter time, that's when uh, most of our organic matter is broken down um, and then in the springtime, it's all pretty much ready to go. Add a little bit of manure on top and another layer of hay, and we're ready to plant, you know, simplify. Then we, yeah, my uh, biggest, um, uh, biggest goal of mine is nothing farming, which you guys may have heard of. It's just the goal of really eliminating most of the work and just allowing nature to do her thing. I think a lot of times in all parts of our lives, we feel that, we have to control situations and we have to make sure it's perfectly this and what is the lab result on this. And you know what? Just follow your intuition and be real with yourself, what you have, what you have access to, 
and go for it. Uh, one of part of our garden too is the King Stropharia or mycelium, the web, and that's so easy to attain. That's like, you can take a little piece of inoculated wood chip from your friend's garden, and now you can put it on your garden, and you feed it, and you take care of it, and now you have this food. This is food. You can actually eat it. It's feeding your plants. It's good for the bees. The bees can also um, be eating this as instead of sugar water, which cuts another cost if you decide to have bees. So there's just a lot of stacking functions and closed loops in this whole system. Everything has its own purpose. Uh, just pictures of butterflies, <laughs> because why not? <laughs> um, we, um, no, I'm, I'm moving into here uh, medicine now, the portion of our, is we're planting a lot of different things in the garden. We're not just planting cannabis, we're planting food, we're planting flowers, we're planting native herbs, we're planting non-native herbs. And the reason for this is because we're wanting to create pollination gardens and we're wanting to create an ecosystem that's welcoming and open to everybody. We all talk about diversity and like this and that. Sometimes you have to go that extra mile to make sure that you're actually creating access points for different beings here in your physical life and in, in all kinds of life forms. So it's another photo of our garden, just an example of growing flowers, growing plants and other food with your cannabis. We do have bees on our property. Um, we really like what they have to offer and we try to offer them as many different flowers as we can. Um, throughout the season, so. And they did bless us this last year by landing on one of the velvet perps. Um, a swarm actually came in and populated that. And we did leave an open box for them. They decided not to stay there. But once you develop this relationship with not just your plants, you start to develop a relationship with all the other beings in your garden as well, the seen and the unseen. And having these bees just come onto a cannabis plant like that, it's like, yeah, you're doing something right. Like the, the bees are here. Some they're you know they're blessing us up as much as we can bless them up. So thank you to the bees. Uh, we like to walk around in the garden barefoot, as you can see. <laughs> it just gives us uh, that connection to what we're doing out in the garden. And uh, I pretty much took it out all like the thistles and stuff that stick okay. in my feet. <laughs> So it's pretty nice to walk around and just have that connection in the garden. Yeah, these are just some other, these next images are just some ways that we connect in our garden. So earth touching is really important and um, being super present in your garden. The only reason we're able to like grow successfully is because someone, mostly him, when I'm not doing like a bunch of a million other things that I'm doing, he is out there in that garden every single day. He knows every single property of every little plant, every. Everything that's going on, forest is aware. And that awareness is really key in your garden. You have to be connected with not just the earth below, what's happening above and everything. So yeah, go out and handle your plants, smell them, you know. Don't handle them too much though. Yeah, don't handle them too much. <laughs> the plants like to be, you know, they're delicate. So another compost pile. Again, um, you can see it's really high there because that's a fresh uh, pile that we made. It's a biodynamic pile, which Blair and Daniel are gonna be talking about next. Um, really beautiful preparations and intentions behind all of the things that you're doing. Another photo of just offering. So we made that pile and then we decided, let's go get some flowers and create a mandala on it and make some special brew and offer it. It's, it's, it's a magic that you're incorporating and it puts you at a different place. When you're not just growing to grow, to receive something, you're actually giving back and it's feeding you in a way. That's really intentional and beautiful and it makes a really big difference in your cannabis. Inviting friends over, doing silly, weird things, <laughs> making it fun, have fun in your gardens. Like invite your friends over and show them like, this is what we're doing. We're all just learning and growing. None of us really know all of it. We're just going along. This is also something weird that we do. <laughs> I'm just, it's an example, just we're always trying new things. We don't um, use a typical reme cloth um, or the reme to, for 
warmth on a little hoop house or something, we decided to try burlap and it has its pros and cons and it's, it actually worked pretty great. We just used whatever was available to us. Uh, yeah. We do uh, use sides to cut the grass in some areas. Um, that just helps not using fossil fuels and uh, just being part regenerative, you know, being regenerative, so. And then you use all that grass, it acts as a mulch in your other gardens. So again, free product, you don't have to buy anything. You have a tool, you do it by hand, it's not the, too hard to operate. You're using it as a, as a fertilizer and a mulch. Working with the garden, all the different herbs that grow in the garden. You're not just growing cannabis, you're growing other medicinal herbs, you're sharing that with your community. Making medicine. Go about your own route. What is it that you wanna make? How do you wanna be special? What are your secondary products? That's a big topic, that, something we've been talking about is, you know, you're, you wanna diversify everything that you're doing. You're not just doing one thing. And this is our last part about community. Um, this is a little gathering we had and a tea, tea lounge that we created on the property. Um, and this brings it back to community. You start with the seeds, you spring intention, and you then welcome everybody to be a part of that so that you're not just enjoying earth and your little farm by yourself, but you're thriving in your community and you have something to offer them. We grew all those herbs and then we threw a party and we were like, we're gonna have a tea bar with these herbs that we grew on the farm. And it just, the vibes and the atmosphere of that celebration were so unique and different because everyone was actually intaking the medicine and everybody was really connected to the earth that they were standing on. So it's things like that, going out of your way to be a part of your community, plant beautiful seeds, not just here, not just in the soil, but all around you and spread them and share them. That's us for now, if you guys I'm have any, hard. yeah. There's one minute if anyone has any questions that we can answer, or we have three minutes. Okay. <laughs> what else do you want to talk about? Forrest will be on a breeder's panel tomorrow at 1, uh, 110 here, talking more about seed selection. We do, cover, we do cover crops uh, in the fall and then in the springtime um, we just chop and drop before the plants have gotten really big. And then in the, in the spring we will do another crop of, um, what do you, of buckwheat. buckwheat that doesn't that does really water. well in the spring. And uh, we just cover that with another layer of hay and that just, it, I, we've never had any burning issues. to let it, things compost. Yeah. When, before we add anything to the soil, like any manures that do need composting, they've already been composted down. So we actually, like when we go to a horse farm, we're like, we want that old stuff. We want that like two year old stuff that's been sitting with their bedding material because I know that's already composted down. I'm not trying to get any fresh manure. The only fresh manure that we're using is the alpaca manure, which you can directly put onto your plants. It doesn't need to be composted. I know what you're saying. As long I as you keep, cover it. keep the canvas plant away from it enough, you know, a little you give it a little buffer zone and we don't have any problems. Yeah. yeah. And then if you cover it with hay or straw, it's, it's starting that process already and you have that little perimeter there. So it's not, nothing is directly touching our stock. We don't water directly on our stocks and we don't put anything up against our stocks. It's all got a little space there. Thank you for asking. We got one more minute. Yeah. So 
So alpacas act like rud rudiments animals, like a cow. They have multiple stomachs, and they actually do the, the composting in their own stomachs. That's why cow shit and cow manure is really great, because they have four different stomachs that it's going through, and it's digesting the grass and making compost inside of its body. So alpaca manure does that already as well. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank We're you. done here.